Thank you to the Civil War Roundtable Congress for having me here today. My name is Lisa G. Samia. This presentation is on John Wilkes Booth and his sister, Asia Booth Clark, called So Runs the World Away. At the conclusion of this presentation, I will read two selected poems from my poetry and essay book, one from The Nameless and the Faceless of the Civil War, and my new book, The Nameless and the Faceless Women of the Civil War, a March release date of 2021. Both of these poems directly correlate to John Wilkes and Asia Booth Clark. Not only are we going to explore the lives of John and Asia, but I will take a couple of instances, events, and present a little bit of a deeper meaning. As an artist and a poet, mindful that it is not just words on a page, but reading into the words and feeling the emotion of the words being said. Our historians tell us the story of and the historical significance of our past, but they don't always explore the meaning of the event through the eyes and the hearts of those individuals who lived and breathed life just like us so many years ago. Unless otherwise indicated, all referenced and quoted material comes from historian and author Terry Alford's book, Fortune's Fool, The Life of John Wilkes Booth, and Asia Booth's Clark, Clark's book, John Wilkes Booth, A Sister's Memoir, edited by Terry Alford. Also, letters to Asia's lifelong friend, Jean Anderson. And a quick note of gratitude for Dr. Alford's support and friendship. A little background on John Wilkes and Asia before we start. John Wilkes was born the ninth of 10 children to Junius Brutus Booth and Mary Ann Holmes on May 10, 1838 in Bel Air, Maryland. Six of the 10 children would reach adulthood. He was born as with most of his siblings in a mod modest log cabin home on the farm. There, um, excuse me, on the farm. There would be four boys and two girls in the Booth household. John was named John Wilkes by his paternal grandfather in recognition of a relative who was the English radical and politician. Older sister Asia, the second oldest daughter, was born on November 20th, 1835. An interesting fact was that it would take many months before the couple chose a name for the child, being undecided whether to call her after the accomplished young actress Sidney Cowell, Mrs. Bateman, who was a great favorite of Mr. and Mrs. Booth, or Aisha, in recollection of one of Mahomet's wives, the Arab prophet who, according to Islam, was the last messenger of Allah. At length, Junius wrote to his wife, Marianne, call the little one Asia, in remembrance of that country where God first walked with man, and Friga, because she came to us on a Friday, the day consecrated to the Norse goddess who presided over marriage and the home. She was in fact about two and a half years older than her brother, John. Their parents were from England. They immigrated to the United States in 1821. Their father, Junius, was the famous actor even before coming to the United States. He performed in the 1820s to the 1840s and made about $5,000 a year which was a very comfortable sum in those times. John had two older brothers, Junius and Edwin, who would also become actors, a younger brother, Joseph, and the two older sisters, of course, Asia and Rosalie. We don't hear much about the booths on Rosalie, just that she was kind and devoted to her mother. A romance that uh, was cut short as a young woman by her father, Junius, seems to have impacted her as to not attempt another romantic adventure. And then to sister Asia, who was the Booth family chronicler, writer, and sometime poet, and incredibly close to her brother, John Wilkes. Youngest brother, Joseph, would have severe bouts of melancholia, like the elder Booth, the father, but would eventually become a doctor. John's father, the great actor, Junius Brutus Booth, suffered with bouts of melancholia, which could have been innate, but was also fueled with his bouts of alcohol. He loved his children, but his difficult, often mercurial behavior, loving one moment, cold and distant the next, would unfortunately be part of his family legacy as well. 
1851-1852, the elder Booth built Tudor Hall on the property at Bel Air, Maryland, a one and a half story Gothic revival home. This home is well preserved and owned by Hoffa County of Maryland. Unfortunately, the elder Booth died in November of 1852 while the home was still being built. The Booths also had a Baltimore City residence on 62 North Exeter Street, purchased in 1845, which was a middle class city townhouse, tree lined streets with a grocer on one side and a banker on the other. This residence is no longer standing. Having this city residence gave the Booth children a greater opportunity for their education. This was more the case for Edwin. Up until about the time he was 12, however, Asia, John, and younger brother Joe. A little about why Edwin's education was up until about he was 12. Edwin was chosen by his mother, Mary Ann, to accompany his father, Junius, on the road and to be his caretaker and dresser. Junius's bouts again with alcohol while on the road, while acting, would on occasion have Junius turn on the audience, insult them, not show up or lock himself in his room. This increasingly difficult behavior forced Mrs. Booth to send her 12 year old son out on the road with the father. This was to ensure his performances and to secure wages needed for the household. John Wilkes would go on to become a famous actor like his father Junius and older brother Edwin. And of course, unfortunately would take center stage as the infamous killer, murderer and assassin of President Lincoln. Asia would go on to marry the comedic actor, theater owner and manager, John Sleeper Clark. She would go on to author three books. The first, Booth Memorials, Passages, Incidents, and anecdotes in the life of Junius Brutus Booth, the elder. This book was published in 1866 and is about the acting life of her famous father. The second book was written in 1874, but was not published until 1838. That was Asia's book, A Sister's Memoir on John Wilkes Booth. This was a secret memoir. She had to hide it from her husband, John Sleeper. Asia's husband blamed the Booth family, especially John Wilkes for his problems. So Asia wrote it in secret and gave it out of the family to have it published, which it was, but not until 1938. This is the longest and most extensive account of John Wilkes by a family member. In 1868, Asia had left the United States with her husband, John, and their children um, to reside in, in England. It is because of Asia that a picture of John in childhood and young manhood is so poignantly brought forth. Asia provides insights into brother John and the emotional reminiscence of their time together growing up at Tudor Hall in the mid 1850s. In the relative isolation of the Maryland countryside, Asia and John became constant companions. Here, they were lonely together as Asia expressed it. And I just wanna stop here just for a moment and just to mention that as to her memoir about John, uh, historians have been generally satisfied with her truthfulness about the memoir. However, we need to remember that these are recollections and memory. This was not a daily diary account of their life together. So just keep that in mind. And her last book, The Elder and the Younger Booth about her famous father and, young, and brother Edwin was published in 1882. It's generally understood that when one gives a presentation like this, it's either that the author has uncovered a new piece of history to bring to light, or that perhaps a new interpretation of existing material is coming forth. Well, I don't have any newly discovered nuggets of history to share with you. However, this presentation on John Wilkes Booth, Asia Booth Clark specifically so runs the world away. We'll look into the five haunting words that are the last line in Asia's book, A Memoir of John Wilkes. It comes from Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 2. We will look deeper into the possible meaning of these words just a bit later in this lecture. We'll also look into John and Asia's early years together. Their similarities in their personalities are shared. They shared a romantic, restless nature, as well as a stubborn, unrelenting side. They remain, remained close even as their lives moved, moved towards and into early adulthood as John pursued the family vocation of acting and Asia became a wife, mother, writer as Asia Booth Clark. 
Many of the letters written by John over the course of his lifetime were destroyed right after the assassination. Again, it was not in your best interest to have any kind of material that related in any way to John Wilkes Booth in the days right after the assassination. Here in this lecture, we'll explore one of his writings. Only about 55 documents written by John Wilkes survived, and these were letters, notes, and or telegraph drafts, and a poem. As Asia says in her memoir, she heartbreakingly pens, all written or printed material found in our possession, everything that bore his name was given up to the authorities, not a vestige remains of aught that belonged to him. His books of music were stolen, seized, or savagely destroyed. Not even the little picture of himself hung over my baby's beds in the nursery. He had placed it there himself saying, remember me babies in your prayers. John's education. John's education began in a one room schoolhouse across the road from the entrance to the Booth Farm, then to Bel Air Academy, then to Baltimore, to the small school run by Susan Hyde, and then a school run by Martin J. Kearney. It was here that Kearney encouraged his students in public speaking. This was well suited to John as he was always ready to have his say. From early boyhood, he was argumentative and fervent in debate. His discussion was didactic, recalled Asia. When his turn came, he would war his argument threadbare. He meant what he cared to utter. From there, he went to a Quaker school, the Milton School for Boys in Sparks, Maryland, which was a classical education. Then to a military high school in St. Timothy's in Catonsville, Maryland, which was a boarding military prep school. This was John's last school that he would attend. One of the attendees at this school was Fitzhugh Lee, the nephew of Robert E. Lee. There were few Northerners at this school. It was, however, the place where many wealthy Southern plantation owners, merchants, etc., sent their sons. So I'm wondering if perhaps John's Southern views were cultivated by the atmosphere of this school. He completed what we would believe to be about halfway through high school. It was said of John that he was more interested on the ride to and from school rather than what was going on in school. He did not take to learning as quickly as his older brothers. His sister Asia said he could learn, but he had to plod. But once attained, he never lost. Once learned, it was stamped on the sight of his mind. He also had very good listening skills. So how was it he was able to become such a famous actor? Well, he was able by learning to memorize these great soliloquies of Shakespeare. Remember, he said that once learned, it was stamped on the sight of his mind. So he used memorization to be able to perform and also listening skills. Remember what Asia said, he was fervent in debate. And in order for you to debate in such a way, you have to listen to what the other individual is saying to you before you can come back certainly with your um, ideas. He developed a way of learning again by memorizing and listening, using these skills to perhaps circumvent his lack of attention to his education. One humbling event to this lack of education as it relates to his poor letter writing was while he was residing in a boarding house in Philadelphia in 1857. This was the time that he was hired at the Arch Street Theater in Philadelphia when he was starting to uh, learn his craft as an actor. It was said, blustering, that a young man at the boarding house had wounded his honor. He wrote out a challenge to a duel. Unfortunately, the writing was that of a boy of seven. It was so wretchedly spelled that when the word of it got around, Booth became the laughing stock of the house. Two thirds of the, the, these approximately 55 letters, the bulk of his known correspondence are full of unsophisticated grammar, poor spelling, and he was aware of them. Yet he would ask the recipient of the letter to excuse him because you know he was tired while writing, he had to run or the light was poor. His schoolboy letters were signed thine till death or yours forever. I am at the best of times, the worst letter writer in the world, he lamented to a friend. But one of the things that he shares with his sister Asia 
is this poetic nature. And I was actually able to find a poem that John Wilkes Booth wrote. John Wilkes Booth met the actress Mary White while at the Marshall Theater in Richmond, Virginia. John was employed at the Marshall Theater from 1858 to 1860 as a stock player actor. An illness forced Mary to leave the company and in a poem to Mary in her autograph album, he penned, Miss White, may all good angels guard and bless thee and from thy heart remove all care. Remember, you should ne'er distress be. Youth and hope can crush despair and joy can be found by all who see it. Only be right the path we move upon. Heaven has marked it, find it and keep it. Ne'er forget the wish of John. Richmond, February 18th, 1860. He who will ever be your friend, J. Wilkes Booth. The first letter of each of the stanzas spell out Mary and John. Mary would die just four months later in Richmond, Virginia. And there are uh, a couple of uh, misspelled words as we know here. This poem demonstrates the romantic nature of John Wilkes, one of the qualities he shares with Sister Asia. As a young man, John was restless and driven, especially in the early years of his acting. This, he said, after a failed performance at the Arch Street Theater in 1857, I must have fame, he would say. He would, however, reach the heights of fame for his acting, making about $20,000 tremendous sum in those days. He said to his sister Asia in 1863, as to, the, as to his earnings, my goose does indeed hang high. John was very protective of the female members of his family. After his father died in 1852, John, along with his sisters, Rosalie Asia, his mother Marianne, and younger brother Joe, left the Baltimore City residence and moved to the farm at Tudor Hall. Here, at the age of 14, John took up the responsibility of caring for his family. An incident in 1854 shows just how protective he was. George B. Hagen, a Virginian, was hired to oversee the farm and learned the hard way of John's overprotectiveness. Marianne complained to the overseer about the overworking of her farm animals. The man became very insolent and called her vile names, said Sister Asia. Absent when the incident occurred, John learned of it upon his return home. He picked up a stick and carrying it like a riding whip, he and his friend Herman Stump, who was a law student, confronted Hagen at his lodgings. John demanded Hagen come to the house and apologize to the ladies. The manager not only refused, but he said there were no ladies at Tudor Hall to whom one might apologize. John exploded in anger at his remark and he clubbed Hagen on the head and shoulder. I knocked him down, which made him bleed like a butcher, he boasted to a friend. The result was a complaint by Hagen. And although he was not not arrested for the attack, John was bound over to keep the peace. This display of protectiveness could possibly have been born from a terrible secret of his father, Junius, that was revealed when John was just a boy. It is my opinion that this discovery impacted John's behavior towards the female members of his family, as well as his aggression, again, towards the overseer and his player attitude towards females in his adulthood. John had lots of girlfriends. And again, that would be for a whole other lecture, right? The year in 1847 saw a great secret of Junius Brutus Booth revealed not only to his family, but to the public as well. The appearance in Baltimore from England of Adelaide Delany Booth, the never divorced wife of Junius Brutus Booth. She had come from Richard that Junius had another family. I bring this up because at the time of this very public revelation, John Wilkes was about nine years old. There were documented violent outbursts from Adelaide towards Mary Ann in public. And these outbursts could possibly have been experienced and witnessed by John Wilkes. From My Thoughts Be Bloody, from Nora Titone, we read an account. 
It was the custom with Adelaide to haunt the Baltimore markets, reported the Baltimore American, for a chance meeting with the woman who had usurped her place in the heart and the home of her husband. These encounters were as much avoided by the one as sought for by the other. When she found Marianne's vegetable stand, Adelaide showed no mercy. The Belgian woman attacked her victim. A journalist wrote with violent, often coarse language and appropriate, appropriate or humiliating epithets. It's not difficult to imagine what insults Adelaide screamed at her husband's mistress, mistress in front of her startled market day crowds. She no doubt decreed Marianne Holmes as a harlot and called whatever child was with her a bastard. Once the divorce from Adelaide was granted, Junius married Marianne on May 10th, 1851, which was John's 13th birthday. Is it possible that John was one of the children mentioned here? Perhaps he did not understand what was happening and we, we know that his parents, Marianne and Junius, did their best to shield their children from this terrible reveal of their father. But certainly he would have felt, uh, the, you know, the, the pulling back from, from being out in public and, and things like that and shuttering the children, you know, away from this. Certainly he would have un seen that and felt that. History tells us it was older sister Rose who later told John the whole story when he was 20. But it is a possibility that the exposure to this terrible public event influenced John Wilkes in ways even he did not realize was happening. Strangely enough, Asia, the Booth family chronicler, is noticeably silent. She writes nothing about this. So that tells you how this must have impacted them, certainly. Asia's education. There's not a lot of facts about Asia's education. Along with her brothers, Edwin, John, and Joseph, she would attend the school schoolhouse run by Susan Hyde in Baltimore. It was here at the Hyde School that Asia would meet her future husband, John Sleeper Clark. John Sleeper would grow attached in friendship and later in business with Edwin. Then again to the Martin J. Kearney School with John. Then only a little bit of information about an unnamed college for young girls where she studied for an unknown amount of time. This was an all girls school, it was taught by men only. The next school Asia would enroll in was a school run by the sisters of the Carmelite convent. Asia would later um, convert to Catholicism. It was here she would receive her formal education and its influence was profound. Again, she would later convert to Catholicism, but they were raised Episcopalians. At the time of John Wilkes Booth's death on April 26, 1865, in Port Royal, Virginia, by the hands of the Union Federal Cavalry, it was noted that John Wilkes Booth had a gold medal around his neck, Agnes D, which is Latin for Lamb of God, it's a Catholic medal, and it was. it is to wonder if perhaps Asia gave John this medal, but there's nothing in history to support who actually gave it to him. It's just interesting he would have that on. She was a lovely young woman. I think I never heard anyone who knew her mention her name without adding, she was a beautiful woman, wrote Ella Mahoney. In 1878, Mrs. Mahoney came to live at Tudor Hall with her husband as a young bride of 20 and remained there until her death after World War II. It was purchased directly from Mrs. Booth. She grew to love the Booths and became a kind of caretaker and writer. Her father had known John Wilkes and she had heard stories of the family, often found things belonging to the Booths in the home and are on the property. Asia had a literary mind and loved to write poetry. It was said Asia was a very smart woman by the by stated one New York City columnist, educated, mathematical, and somewhat of a writer and tremendously strong-minded. Again, we know that's the trait she shares with her brother John. When, John, when her brother John was born, their mother Marianne had a vision in which she believed he would die an early and unnatural death. She actually saw the word country in the fireplace flames. 
a glimpse here of a poem written by Asia to her mother on her birthday, trying to explain the meaning of the vision. This is just a snippet of the poem. The Mother's Vision, written 1854, June 2nd by Asia Booth, Hafford County, Maryland. Tween the passing night and the coming day, when all the house in slumber lay, a patient mo mother sat low near the fire, with that strength even nature cannot tire, nursing her fretful babe to sleep, only the angels these records keep, oh, of mysterious love. I implore to know on this ghostly night, whether twill labor for wrong or right, for or against thee, the flame up leapt, like a wave of blood and avenging on crept into shape and country shone out in the flame, which fading resolved to her boy's own name. God had answered love, impatient love. She could also be rigid and sensitive where she would sulk at the smallest incident. These hours of self-inflicted torment were filled with anger against everyone Asia wrote of herself. Her father, Junius, would caution everyone to leave her alone on these occasions since no reasoning would melt a sulky temper. Asia shares a bit of the melancholia with her father and father Junius and younger brother Joseph, but certainly not to their extent. Her personality is further revealed in her letters to her lifelong friend, Jean Anderson. Asia had an explosive side to her. This was revealed in her attitude and open dislike of her sister-in-law, Mary Devlin Booth. This is the wife of Edwin Booth. She writes to Jean, I believe in 1860, she writes, to think that my brother, the best beloved of all, should occasion these bitter tears nor less than that long dreaded affair with Miss Devlin. No, I will not write the evil that I invoke on her. You know how I detest and despise the woman and actress, not even second rate, yet the position is no nothing to me. I think only of the bold faced woman who can strut before a nightly audience, who can allow men of all kinds to caress and court her in a business way, Jean. She wants his money in his name, a grand position for a poor girl. Her feelings are the lowest Irish class living here in the city. I wanted to love Ned's wife, to let her be my sister, but I cannot stoop to that which I despise. Jean, if I were not worried over the consummation of this devil and affair, I should certainly to that place of peace, the convent. All my life long, some loving hand has seemed beckoning me there. Mary Devlin would marry Edwin Booth in July of 1860. Brother John was the only Booth in attendance. After the ceremony, he kissed his brother Edwin. She would have a baby girl in December of 1861 named Edwina. Mary would later die on February 21st, 1863 in Dorchester, Massachusetts. She was just 22 years old. Some of Asia's reminiscence of their time at Tudor Hall with John. Asia writes, he was never known to throw off a friend or to slight an acquaintance. The love of his boyhood with those of his manhood. His affection was as retentive as his memory. As a boy, he was beloved by his associates. And as a man, few could withstand the fascination of his modest, gentle qualities. He inherited some of the most prepossessing qualities of his father. And while that father's finely shaped head and beautiful face were reproduced in him, he had the black hair and large hazel eyes of his mother. These were fringed heavily with long up curling lashes, a noticeable peculiarity as rare as beautiful. Of their time together at Tudor Hall, she writes, Wilkes' bedroom was facing the east. He said, no setting sun view for me. It is too melancholy. Let me see him rise. He wanted no carpet on the floor. He liked the smell of the oak. Once he burst out with joyous exclamation, heaven and earth, how glorious it is to live. How divine to breathe this breath of life with a clear mind and healthy lungs. Don't let us be sad, he would say. Life is so short and the world is so beautiful. Just to breathe is delicious. 
John's acting. John made his acting debut in August of 1855 at the age of 17 in Richard III at the Charles at the St. Charles Theater in Baltimore, in which he gave an unsuccessful performance. He would not attempt another performance until 1857 at the age of 19 at the Arch Street Theater in Philadelphia. Then in 1858 to 1860 would find him at the Marshall Theater in Richmond, Virginia. It was here he learned his craft as a stock player actor. It should also be noted that the city of Richmond embraced young John Wilkes in his acting. His striking good looks, his charm and acting ability gave him great entrance into Richmond society. It would only make sense then that when Virginia succeeded from the Union and Richmond became the capital of the Confederacy in 1861, he would doubly embrace that city for we know John was a Southern sympathizer, of course. We know that John took his acting very seriously and worked very hard at his craft. Many of his roles called for very physical scenes and sword fights. John was known to injure himself as well as his favorite fellow actors when in these very physical scenes. In one instance, while performing at the Boston Museum in 1862 in Romeo and Juliet, co-star Catherine Rheingold was physically bruised and bumped during the production. That rang true that while holding the limp Juliet, her hair became entangled in the buttons of his tunic. Well, he walked the stage nonetheless, dragging poor Catherine while she lost her shoes, powder her costume. He was very proud of his physical self. He would spend hours in the gym defining and toning his body. He was like quick as a cat on the stage. Watching his sword fights, I, I understand from, from what I've read and research, were truly incredible. I guess in today's, today's vernacular, you know, if he was hanging out a lot at the gym, we would call him a gym rat, right? Again, once he took his acting career very seriously, once he, once he learned, once he studied, once he, he uh, was at the Richmond uh, Theater, his star rose quickly and shone brilliantly. It is said by the great actor of his time, Edwin Forrest, that an actor was truly great if he could play three major roles better than anyone else in the nation. And that designation we can apply to John Wilkes Booth. Let's take a look at these three major leagues, leads, which in fact set him as the best of the best. Booth's friend John Matthews fought Pescara in the apostate, was Booth's finest role. Pescara was a malignant and bloodthirsty villain. He was the biggest fiend on the Civil War stage, and Booth made that evident in every way. Even his makeup for the character was so frightening that he once was forced to pause his performance and reassure the youthful actress, Catherine Evans, it's just me, it's just Johnny underneath. Edwin Booth saw John's Pascara at the Boston Museum on January 21st, 1863, and theatrical tradition has it that he presented the younger brother with his own costume for the role. I shall never play it again after seeing you, Edwin told him. The second role in Forrest's required trio for greatness was the one John Wilkes Booth performed most often in his career, the title character in Richard III. The New York Tribune joined in praise noting Booth is head and shoulders above those who ordinarily attempt Richard III, an intellectual breadth and powers of concentration. The New York Times and Messenger felt that Richard is acknowledged to be without a rival on the American stage. Ford thought Booth's Richard was unequaled by any contemporary. The third role was his Raphael in the Marble Heart, which was exceptional. Booth played the sculptor Phineas, who had the misfortune to love a hard-hearted and materialistic woman. Since openness, sincerity were required for this role, this character, this role was markedly different from the villainous Richard and Pescara. It's opposite, in fact, and showed Booth's range that he could realize it. His Raphael was simply matchless, concurred John T. Ford of Ford's Theater. He was the ideal. He was the greatest that was ever seen. Clara Morris, from my life on the stage, my personal experiences and recollections. Clara Morris performed with John Wilkes. She says, at the theater, good heavens, 
as the sunflowers turn on their stalks to follow the beloved sun, so old or young our faces smiling turn to him. From backstage at the Lincoln assassination by Thomas A. Bogar, we read, actor Edward Alfred expressed it well. With men, John Wilkes was most dignified in manner, bearing himself with insouciant care and grace and was a brilliant talker. With women, he was a man of irresistible fascination by reason of his superbly handsome face, controversial brilliancy, and a peculiar halo of romance with, he, with, with which he invested himself in which the ardent imagination of women amplified. Asia's married life. John Wilkes warned of her marriage to John Sleeper. Asia writes, in 1859, Wilkes came, for, came from Richmond where he was fulfilling an engagement to be present at my wedding. Asia married John Sleeper Clark in April of 1859 in Philadelphia. He returned to that city immediately after the wedding. He was not pleased at my marriage. And the strange words he whispered to me were, always bear in mind that you are a professional stepping stone. Our father's name is a power theatrical in the land. It is dour enough for any struggling actor. Was this said by John for he feared Asia was being used perhaps by her husband to be? I would like to stop here for a moment and delve just a little bit deeper into what is being said here. Mindful of those never just words on a page. John did not like Asia's husband, John Sleeper. He was in fact, John Sleeper, a very successful comedic actor and a later theater manager and owner. And we have to remember it was John Sleeper who helped John Wilkes secure the first step of his acting career, this at the Archery Theater in Philadelphia, again in 1857. See, during the war on one occasion, John Wilkes actually attacked his brother-in-law for his defamation of the South and Southern leadership. Now we have to remember all the family knew of John's fervor for the South. But you know, this occasion was marked where John Wilkes was so incensed at his brother-in-law's remarks about the South. It was said he leapt at his brother-in-law and tried to pull his head off his body. Yeah, I know that might seem comical, right? But John Wilkes Booth was very, very strong. And it took more than a few individuals to actually pull him off his brother-in-law. But there's something more I would like to explore about his comment of being a professional stepping stone. John Wilkes and Sister Asia, as we know, were very close, remained so after leaving Tudor Hall and going about their lives. Perhaps in this warning to Asia, he's not only perceived this quality of his future brother-in-law, perceived it and warned his sister that perhaps John Sleeper's intentions were not entirely for her affection, but rather for the future advancement within the theatrical world. John Sleeper and Edwin Booth would become successful theater owners and managers. So it helps, I guess, when you marry into the Booth family, right? Unfortunately, this prophetic warning would come back to Asia later in her marriage. She wrote to her brother Edwin while residing in England about the lack of affection from her husband. They slept most nights at the theater and said he was leading a bachelor's life. And hauntingly to further this in a letter to her friend, Jean Anderson, Asia had written she had married John Sleeper Clark. Clearly this was said not in jest to please her brother Edwin. That's a very strong statement. As the Civil War raged on, John did not enlist in the Confederacy due to a promise he made to his mother. She was his protector when he was growing up. In fact, the favorite child of mother and father. It was said at the time John wanted to enlist in the Confederacy, Mrs. Booth refused to give him her blessing. She was fearful of losing her most favorite child. He begged his mother to allow him to go south for John T. Ford. She most earnestly refused. Mrs. Booth had lost four children before John was born. In 1833, she lost three. She refused to let John Wilkes enlist in the Confederacy. She would not give up the son. Again, we hear from Sister Asia to her friend, Jean Anderson. John Wilkes is crazy or enthusiastic about joining for a soldier. And again, she added a sister's special insight. It has been his early ambition, perhaps his true vocation. Booth might have made a good soldier, fighting well, filling a cavalryman's grave by mid-war, but the conflict would go on without him. To fulfill an obligation to his mother he considered sacred, he made a fateful decision that went against his nature. 
Remember, John Wilkes would call himself a coward for not enlisting. And when he was acting on the stage and all these great Shakespearean plays and tragedies, and these sword fights, he was playing a hero. But that was just play acting. When in the course of reality, he called himself a coward. However, we do know that John was in some way affiliated with the Confederacy. For if he could not physically fight for the Confederacy, he would find a way to help, and he did. From Asia's memoir, she writes, she's talking to her brother John here. A man came here the other day for Dr. Booth. What does that mean? I fancied one who had known Joseph as a medical student at Philadelphia or with Dr. Columbus de Vega at the South, but and she goes on. And John says to her, all right, he said lightly, I am he, if to be a doctor means a dealer in quinine. And she asks, the drug the North says is more in requisitions than food for Southerners? And he says simply, yes. I knew now that my hero was a spy, a blockade runner, a rebel. I set the terrible words before my eyes and knew that each step, each step one meant death. I knew that he was today what he had been from childhood, an ardent lover of the South, and her policy and upholder of Southern principles. I knew that if he had 20 lives, they would be sacrificed freely for that cause. He was a man so single in his devotion, so unswerving in his principles. He would yield everything for the cause he so espoused. Ever faithful was oftentimes the only ending of his boy, boy, boyish letters from Catonsville. These words might serve as his epitaph, for he was in love, friendship, and principle ever faithful. March 18, 1864 was John's last appearance on the stage in Pescara in Washington, DC. Asia writes of the last time she saw her brother, John. As I sat on the sofa, he came and knelt down at my feet and I laid his head on my lap. After a little time during which I smoothed his black hair carelessly, he said, looking at my face, when will your child be born, my girl? In five months, I think, or less. I hope you will keep well and get stronger, dear. Then as we rose together, he kissed me very tenderly and said, God bless you, sister mine. Take care of yourself and try to be happy. Oh, my boy, I said, with all the anxiety in my heart, I shall never be happy till I see your face again. And of course she never did for she says, there's no more to add. The rest is horror fitter for a diary than for these pages. She was expecting in the summer of 1865, she had promised her brother John, if she had a boy, she would name him after him. But of course, that was impossible after his most grievous act. On August 20th, 1865, she delivered a set of twins, a boy and a girl. She named the boy Creston, who also grew up to be an actor, the child bearing a strong resemblance to his uncle John. The most favorite child of his mother and father, loving brother, uncle, son, acclaimed actor, the handsomest man in America. It was said of John, yet for all the love and accolades, it was not enough. His own self-loathing of not entering the Civil War by a promise made to his mother, playing a hero on the stage, yet calling himself a coward, and watching his beloved Confederacy fall in defeat, somehow all contrived to negate that laurel of praise. He was at the very morning of his life. I want to stop here for a moment, and let's look a little bit deeper into the scene, specifically the words, sister mine mindful it's never just words on a page this is a heartbreaking scene this is the last time brother and sister would see each other john's resting on her lap and she's stroking his hair perhaps this was done when they were growing up together it's a gesture born of love and affection but again he must know this is the last time he's going to see her she has no idea why does he call her sister mine right he doesn't say of mine or my sister, but rather sister mine. Those two words together to me as a poet is a tell, revealing that sister mine is John's way of stating that before she had the affection of her husband, John Sleeper, John Wilkes was the center of her affection and attention. It appears here that John is asserting this claim to her knowing in his heart this may be the last time he will see her, and unfortunately it was. The assassination aftermath. 
Asia would give us a glimpse into the pain that she and her family were submitted to right after the assassination in a book she wrote and was published in 1866, the year after the assassination. The book is called Booth Memorials, Passages, Incidents, Anecdotes in the Life of Junius Brutus Booth, the Elder. Here she cries out, calamity without precedent has fallen our country. We of all families, secure in domestic love and retirement are stricken desolate. The name we would have enwreathed in laurels is dishonored by a son, his well-beloved, his bright boy, Absalom. Asia is talking about when she references here, Absalom. Absalom was from the Bible. It's King David's third most son. John Wilkes was the third Booth son as well. Story of Absalom is that not only was he the handsomest man in that kingdom, John Wilkes again was called the handsomest man in America, that he in fact rose up against his own father, Absalom, and tried to steal his kingdom, whereupon he was not successful and he destroyed himself. It's Asia's lament at this reference to her brother, John, whom she loved that calls out from her heart the disgraced name of the third son of King David, his well-beloved, his bright boy, Absalom. This paragraph comes from her book, The Booth Memorials. It's located in the second paragraph in the introduction. Place there on purpose, not to be missed, stating unequivocally, the author's pain. In the aftermath of the assassination, Asa says, it was like the days of the Bastille in France. Arrests were made suddenly in the dead of night, no reason or warning given, only let anyone breathe a sigh of doubt, doubt of the most innocent person and arrest followed swift. And that incarceration meant to wait the law's leisure, innocent or guilty. And she says, someone sent up by my servant, a slip from a newspaper, with the announcement that on hearing the news, again, of the assassination, Mrs. J.S. Clark had gone mad and was at present confined at the asylum at West Philadelphia, North, East, West, the papers teemed with the most preposterous adventures and eccentricities and ill deeds of the vile Booth family. The tongue of every man and woman was free to revile and insult us, she says, every man's hand was against us. From the diary of John Wilkes Booth, an excerpt from one of the 12 days he was on the run, on April 22nd or 23rd in 1865, from the, Lincoln, from the Abraham Lincoln assassination, he wrote, after being hunted like a dog through swamps, woods, and last night being chased by gunboats till I was forced to return wet, cold, and starving, with every man's hand against me, I am here in despair. Edwin Booth's letters at this sad time were filled by reiterated suggestions for Clark to dissolve all partnership with him. Remember, they were partners. He must not be bound in any way to him whose name and fame were clouded. He must sever all connection with him theatrically and forever now. She says this was a generous offer made when he, Edwin Booth, had all the world against him. But he little knew how ungenerous an offer John S. Clark was about to make to one whom he was sworn to keep faithful to under more solemn bonds than those of business. John Sleeper Clark would ask Asia for a divorce shortly after the assassination, which she would not agree to. The incomprehensible words of Wilkes Booth resounded through the years that followed this astounding heart sickening proposition. We go back to the statement, bear in mind that you are only a professional stepping stone. There's a little bit of an interesting usage of the phrase here, I just wanna go over them. Every man's hand was against us. That's what Asia wrote. John wrote with every man's hand against me in his diary and Asia would write all the world against him in referencing to Edwin. John Wilkes Booth diary was written as we know in April of 1865. Asia's memoir on her brother John was not written until 1874. It's very interesting here that Asia would use these variations of this phrase in her memoir on her brother John. Very interesting, she pulled that. 
She writes, I love my brothers devotedly, but Wilkes and I had grown nearer in those late years at the farm when we were lonely together. My marriage, which he often urged me to free myself from, was becoming less pleasing to him. This and his professional pursuit separated us at long intervals. The doom that fell on him was not wrought from a maniac brain or a wicked heart, nor from an irreligious soul or a degraded nature. I believe that with the kidnapping scheme was laid to rest. Remember the original plan was to kidnap Abraham Lincoln, but after um, Richmond fell and then Lee surrendered, um, that's when John thought to take a more drastic course of action. So she says, I believe that with the kidnapping scheme was laid to rest, although with curses, the cherished hope of saving those he would have died to serve. But the fall of Richmond rang in with maddening, exasperating clang of joy and that triumph entry into the fallen city, which was not magnanimous, breathed air afresh upon the fire which consumed him. This man was noble in his life. He periled his immortal soul and he was brave in death. Already his hidden remains are given a Christian burial and strangers have piled his grave with flowers. Asia ends her memoir of, with her, for her brother John with a line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. We're going to revisit this now, and here it is. So runs the world away, act three, scene two. The full statement is, for some must watch while some must sleep, so runs the world away. It gave me pause as to try to decipher what Asia meant by so runs the world away and why she chose this particular line to end her memoir of her brother John. I mean, of all the lines of Shakespeare, all the tragedies, all the plays, she uses this one. Why is that? What is she trying to tell us? Mindful again, it is not just words on a page. Well, perhaps it's not so much that John Wilkes prefer, performed in so many Shakespearean tragedies, it's that Asia is telling us here that in the end, not only did John create the greatest of all American tragedies, he in fact, became an American tragedy himself. Asia would move to England with her husband, John, and her children in 1868, far away from the memory of John's horrible deed. Yet her life there was not happy. While her husband, John, flourished in his career, lonely and increasingly ill with rheumatism, she grew to detest London. Husband and wife were growing apart. She wrote to her brother, Edwin, that Clark kept a private room at the theater and often slept there. If he came home, it was late at night when all were asleep, she says. He lives a life of mystery and silence as far as I'm concerned. He lives a free going bachelor life and does what he likes. She believes some of the Clark's time was being shared with another woman. A bachelor in all but a name, Clark had limited involvement with the nine babies. Three additional children had been born after the move to England daughter Joan and two others whose names are not known. All of them died. Asia had written to her friend Jean, she was getting hardened to sorrow like poor mother. But the pallor of grief yet was yet to surround Asia once more. John and Asia's most favored child, Edwin, became an officer in the British Merchant Navy. On December 10th, 1881, while on a voyage from Australia, he was lost at sea. He was just 20 years old. After everything that had happened in her life, Edwin's death was the devastating blow and spirit breaker for Asia. The Booths have a family pot plot in Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, Maryland. I have visited there many times. Most of the Booth families buried there with the exception of Edwin and brother Junius. Upon the death of Asia Booth Clark, in England in 1888, at the age of 52, she asked of her husband, John, and her children to be buried in the Booth plot in Baltimore. And so she rests there, just steps away from her brother, John, who is also buried there in an unmarked grave. A haunting fact of history of a love between a brother and a sister, reunited together forever in oblivion. I will now read two selected poems from the Nameless and Faceless of the Civil War and my soon to be released Nameless and Faceless Women of the Civil War. The concept of these books is giving a voice to those who did not make it into the history books yet experienced the events of the Civil War. 
There is no north or south in this collection. The lines are blurred. There's no Mason-Dixon line, for it's this author's opinion that suffering has no boundaries. First poem I will read from the Nameless and the Faceless of the Civil War is called Tudor Hall, Bel Air, Maryland. We'll see who you think is speaking here in this poem. I remember it well, the sweet, sweet dreams of where I called home forever ago, it seems, cast now in shadows of what once was, never to come again, gives me such pause. Of a boyhood, I can only see that was sublime, rich, and meant to be. The love I have as a mother's son left only to God, thy will be done. And whose laughter I do hear in my mind, sweet, kind, wonderfully sublime, a dear sweet sister's love forever ago as if from above. And such time in our most early of years is gone now and left only to tears. But I remember it all so very well, Tudor Hall it was called, yet I am in hell. For all I have done and most assuredly deceived the one true cause of which I believed and leaves me here cast in the swamp and cold, running from all, yes, it was so bold. And as I wait for those to help and aid, left only to despair and prayed, and think then of my boyhood place, in times of joy, now times of disgrace. In Bel Air it was, in the greenest of Glen. Goodbye, Sister Asia, never again. The second poem I will read is from my new collection, The Nameless and the Faceless Women of the Civil War. The name of the poem, My Absalom. We'll see here who's speaking. I remember at the time of your birth, mother's favorite of all her boys, there came to her a premonition that cut her soul from joy. For in the firelight, firelight of when she nestled you tight, she saw the flames rise and fall and told me of your plight. I knew then as the flames danced and licked the crackling wood within that somehow, some way, my brother, there would be no absolution from sin. And as I watched you grow and change into the handsomest man of all, yet in your heart raged some, some hate of this it would befall. Such fame you had notwithstanding a mother's love as I knew to save you from impending doom, yet all it was too late for this I bid adieu. Yet do we know the story of Absalom, King David's third most boy, like you, my darling Johnny, created in such a destroy. So what of a mother's love who cried for you on her knee, a life so misunderstood, my darling, my Absalom, you are now free. So we wonder who's speaking here, Sister Asia. Thank you very much.